Sahana Bhavatu Sahano Bunatu Sahaviryam Karavavahai Tejasrina Vaditamastu Mavir Vishavahai Om Shanti 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 May Brahman protect us, may he guide us and give us strength and right understanding. May love and harmony be with us all. Om peace, peace, peace. And good evening. We're going to continue as we did last week with the parables of Ramakrishna as remembered by Swami Abedananda. And we'll also have a, a musical parody uh, parable in the middle uh, to present to you one of the ones that he actually doesn't present. So that's our program for today. And let's see, where did we leave off? Ready for 523. Five, parable 523? Mm -hmm. 523. All right. The alligator. Ah. All right. Parable 523. Okay. You ready? Mm -hmm. The alligator loves to swim on the surface of the water, but as soon as he rises up, he is made a mark up by the hunters. Necessarily, he is obliged to remain underwater and cannot rise to the surface. Still, whenever he finds an opportunity, he rises up with a deep whizzing noise and swims happily on the wide watery expanse. O oh man, entangled in the meshes of the world, thou too art anxious to swim on the surface of the ocean of bliss, but art prevented from doing so by the importunate demands of thy family. But be of good cheer, and whatever you find, any leisure, call intensely upon God. Pray to him earnestly, and tell him your sorrows. In his proper time, he will surely emancipate you and enable you to swim merrily on the surface of the ocean of divine bliss. Well, and of course, we have to make our uh, family life and our business life part of our spiritual practice that we're serving God in uh, the family members, we're serving God in our clients or our, uh, the people that we're working with. And so it becomes part of our spiritual sadhana. Uh, so, all right, let's read the next one. The maid servant says with reference to her master's house, this is our house. All the while she knows the house is not her own, that her own house is far away in a distant village. Her thoughts are all sent to her village home. Again, referring to her master's child in her arms, she says, oh, my Hari, that being the name of the child, Going very naughty, where my Hari likes to eat this or that, and so on. But all the while, she knows for certain that Hari is not her own. Well, I tell those who come to me to lead a life unattached like this maidservant. I tell them to live unattached to this world, to be in the world, but not of the world, at the same time to have their mind directed to God, the heavenly home from whence all come. I tell them to pray for bhakti. Yes, and it, this reminds me of uh, one uh, person who said that, you know, she considered all the things that she had. She had been fortunate to, uh, to have a good marriage and a good life. And she said, I, I just consider myself the caretaker of these uh, things. And uh, that was her attitude. And of course, uh, we can also uh, take the attitude of somebody in a play. You know, you take a character on a play and the character has all these uh, wants and desires and personality traits and talents and so forth. But you know they're not yours. You've just taken on this persona uh, because of the play that you're in. And when you walk off the stage, then, then you're the true self. And so similarly, our life here in the world is uh, just a play and we've been assigned some role in it to learn some lessons in the divine scheme of things and eventually uh, we'll be yanked off the stage <laughs> and uh, 
be back to our true self. All right, let's read about this Brahman and the king. A learned Brahman once went to a wise king and said, Hero king, I'm well versed in the holy scriptures and intend to teach you the holy book, the Bhagavatam. The king who was the wiser of the two, well knew that a man who would really study the Bhagavatam would seek more to know his own self than honor and wealth in a king's court. And he replied, Oh, I see, O Brahman, that you yourself have not mastered that book thoroughly. I promise to make you my tutor, but go first and learn the scripture well. The Brahman went on his way thinking within himself, hmm. How foolish the king is to say I have not mastered the Bhagavatam. <laughs> well, when I've been reading the book over and over for all those years, however, he went over the book carefully once more and appeared before the king. The king told him the same thing again and sent him away. The Brahmin was sorely vexed, but thought that there must be some meaning for this behavior of the king. He went home, shut himself up in his closet, and applied himself more than ever to the study of the book. By and by, the hidden meanings began to flash before his intellect. The vanity of running after the bubbles, riches, and honor, kings and courts, wealth and fame, all vanished before his unclouded vision. From that day onward, he gave himself up entirely to attain perfection by the worship of God and never returned to the king. A few years after, the king thought of the Brahmin, went to his house to see what he was about. Seeing the Brahmin all radiant with the divine light and love, he fell upon his knees and said, Oh, I see that you have now arrived at the true meaning of the scriptures. I'm ready to be your disciple if you will condescend to make me one. Oh, beautiful. And of course, uh, even in a, in a smaller sense, we've all experienced that when we read a scripture for a second time and a third time and a fourth time, as we go through our years, that uh, as we grow and mature spiritually and have different experiences throughout life, you pick up things and you think, oh gosh, I don't remember reading that before. or. Or, oh, no, you know, I, I see what this passage is meaning. So we pick up new meanings each time we read a scripture, and that's why it's often said to just continue to read uh, the really important scriptures like the Gospel of Ramakrishna, the Bhagavad Gita, the Upanishads, uh, over and over. Just reading it once is not is not necessarily enough. And, of course, this applies for any kind of knowledge, too, that you tend to pick up more things the more times uh, you read them. Because you've, you've changed when you've read it another time, uh, you've had more experiences. And so the, the different things strike you as being important and you're seeing things from different perspectives. And so different truths are revealed to you. So uh, that's a good lesson to continue to read the important scriptures over and over. All right, let's uh, continue. A jnani, the knower of God, and the pramika, a lover of God, were once passing through a forest. On the way, they saw a tiger at a distance. The jnani said, there's no reason why we should flee. Almighty God will certainly protect us. But the pramika said, I know, brother, come. Let's run away. Why should we trouble the Lord for what could be accomplished by our own exertions? Yeah, so, so yeah, that's a, a pretty short parable. But anyway, it, uh, it does show a, an interesting point that we should, you depend on the Lord, but it doesn't mean you just kind of lie down and play dead and don't do anything. You, <laughs> you still do what you can, you can do and then depend on the Lord for the best outcome. All right. In the month of June, a young goat was playing near his mother. When with a merry frisk, he told her he meant to make a feast of uh, has flowers, the species of flowers budding abundantly during 
the lime of the Rosalita festival. Probably the time. Yeah. <laughs> well, my darling, replied the mother, it is not such an easy thing as you seem to think. You'll have to pass through many crises before you can hope to feast on raj flowers. The interval between the coming September and October is not very auspicious to you, for someone may take you for a sacrifice to the goddess Durga. Then you will have to get through the time of Kali Puja. And if you're fortunate enough to escape through that period, there comes the Jagadatri Puja, when almost all the surviving male members of our tribe are destroyed. If your good luck leads you safe and sound through all these crises, then you can hope to make a feast to Raj flowers in the beginning of November. Like the diamonds of fable, we should not ram. hastily. I think it's probably ram. <laughs> I'm sorry? I think it's probably like the ram. Oh, like the ram in the yeah. fable. <laughs> we should not hastily approve of all the aspirations which our youthful hopes may entertain by remembering the manifold crisis which we shall have to pass through in course of our lives. Yeah, so we, everyone, this, this book is a scan, and so every once in a while the scanner uh, puts up a rather humorous word in place of the real one. Uh, and the, the spell checker doesn't catch it because it's, an, it's a perfectly good word, it just doesn't fit. So uh, anyway, we can, get, we can get through this. Uh, let's see, now I've lost my place here. Uh, I'm ready for the elephant. All right, let's, oh, the blind man and the elephant. Gee, we could have played that parable too. All right, well, we'll play a different one. Floor, four blind men went to see an elephant. One touched the leg of the elephant and said, the elephant's like a pillar. The second touched the trunk and said, oh, the elephant's like a thick club. The third touched the belly and said, oh, the elephant's like a big jar. The fourth touched the ears and said, oh, the elephant's like a big winnowing basket. Thus they began to dispute among themselves as to the figure of the elephant. The passerby seeing them thus quarreling said, well, what is it you're disputing about? They told him everything and asked him to arbitrate. The man said, none of you has seen the elephant. The elephant is not like a pillar. Its legs are like pillars. It's not like a big water vessel. Its belly's like a big water vessel. It's not like a winnowing basket. Its ears are like winnowing baskets. It's not like a stout club, but its proboscis is like that. The elephant is the combination of all these. In the same manner, those who quarrel have seen only one aspect of the deity. Good. All right, that's a famous story, and it's told in many ways. This is uh, uh, this one has a few different details, but it's always the same idea that uh, if you've only uh, seen part of something or seen something from one angle, you only get a partial uh, truth and not the whole truth. So let's see. Oh yeah, this is a good one too about. Uh, sort of interfaith harmony here. So let's talk about the, the Yanat Karna. Karna. <laughs> there was a man who worshiped Shiva. He hated all other deities. One day Shiva appeared to him and said, I shall never be pleased with thee so long as you hate the other gods. The man was inexorable. After a few days, Shiva again appeared to him said, I shall never be pleased with you so long as you hate. The man kept silent. After a few days, Shiva again appeared. This time he appeared as Harihar, namely one side of his body was that of Shiva, the other side that of Vishnu. The man was half pleased and half displeased. He laid the offerings on the side representing Shiva, and he did not offer anything to the side representing Vishnu. Then Shiva said, oh, your bigotry is unconquerable. I, by assuming this dual aspect, tried to convince you that all gods and goddesses 
are but various aspects of one absolute Brahman. Yeah, and I think there was one version where he was waving the incense and he was holding the nostril of the, <laughs> of the Vishnu side uh, closed so that it <laughs> couldn't enjoy <laughs> the, the incense. But uh, this, this is the, uh, the wonderful aspect of Hinduism that teaches the broadness of, and <laughs> acceptance of all the different paths and that we, sh we shouldn't be narrow-minded. So that's a wonderful story. All right, let's go on to the next one. Once a dispute arose in the court of the Maharaja of Burdwan among the learned men there as to who was the greater deity, Shiva or Vishnu. Some gave preference to Shiva and others to Vishnu. When the dispute grew hot, a wise pundit remarked, addressing the Raja, Sire, I've never met Shiva nor seen Vishnu. How can I say who's the greater of the two? At this, the dispute stopped, for none of the disputants really had seen the deity. Similarly, none should compare one deity with another. When a man has really seen a deity, he comes to know that all the deities are manifestations of one and the same Brahman. Yeah, yeah pretty much the same, same moral to the story. All right, uh, let's see. Okay, let's continue with this one. Many roads lead to Calcutta. A certain man started from his home in a distant village towards the metropolis. He asked a man on the road, what road must I take to reach Calcutta soon? The man said, follow this road. Proceeding some distance, he met another man and asked him, is this the shortest road to Calcutta? The men replied, oh no, you must retrace your footsteps. Take the road to your left. The man did so. Going on the new road for some distance, he met a third man who pointed him out another road in Calcutta. <clears> That's <throat> the traveler made no progress, spent the day in changing one road for another. As he wanted to reach Calcutta, he should have stuck to the road pointed out to him by the first man. Similarly, those who want to reach God must follow one and only guide guru. And that's similar to the story about digging the wells and, find, and uh, uh, digging a few feet down here and giving up and digging a few feet down over there and digging and giving up and so forth and so on. Uh, <clears throat> and of course, uh, sort of a corollary to this one is that probably all those paths were perfectly good paths to Calcutta. So following any one of them would have been fine, but you have to stick to one. You can't just keep switching back and forth try, trying to make up your mind. All right, let's read about the Brahman in the garden here. The Brahman was laying out a garden. He looked after it day and night. One day a cow straying into the garden browsed away a carefully watched tree of the Brahman. The Brahman, seeing the cow destroy his favorite plant, came wild with rage and gave such a sound beating to the animal, she died of the injuries received. News soon spread like wildfire that the Brahmin had killed the sacred animal. The Brahmin was a so-called Vedantist and when taxed with the sin, denied it, saying, no, I have not killed the cow. It's my hand that has done it. And as Indra is the presiding deity of the hand, if someone has incurred the guilt of killing the cow, it's Indra, not I. Indra in his heaven heard all this and assumed the shape of an old Brahmin came to the owner of the garden and said, Sir, whose garden is this? The Brahmin said, Mine. It's a beautiful garden. You've got a skillful gardener, for see how neatly and artistically he has planted the trees. Well, sir, that's also my work. The trees were planted under my personal supervision and direction. Oh, indeed, you're very clever. But who has laid out this road? It's very ably planned and neatly executed. All this has been done by me. Then Indra with joined hands said, when all these things are yours, 
you take credit for all the works done in the garden, it's hard lines for poor Indra to be responsible for the killing of the cow. Yeah, that's, a, that's a very uh, undigested Vedantic view is to uh, pretend that you haven't done things that you've done. Um, when you're in the realm of Maya, you really can't get out of it that way. All right, let's take time for the musical parable. This is the parable of the pundit who couldn't swim. And so it, the musical symbolism here is that uh, you'll hear the, uh, the cheery music at the beginning as the boatman's uh, uh, welcoming the passengers onto his little boat. And uh, then they begin to cross the river and the pundit is very proud of himself and keeps trying to talk the, the boatman, and there's another passenger in this version, a farmer, trying to talk them into uh, uh, you know, what kind of scriptures they know and wouldn't they like to learn from him and so forth. And meanwhile, the seas are getting choppier and choppier. So you'll hear the rhythm of the music get faster and faster and the tempo of the uh, rhyming couplets getting faster and faster. So uh, let's see if we can enjoy this. We're going to try to get the lyrics so that you can see them. Is that like rolling down, rolling on a river? I can see the trail.
from books and vulgar bad vernacular. I've never read a word of it, I'm sure it's very fine. I have to roll this boat in every hour the sun shines. I have learned to quote it since it's literary treasure. Living life without it would remove one fourth my pleasure. Wind is picking up some more and waves are now a tire. I will keep you posted if our fate is looking dire. For every bar of silence, though I'd rather not participate in the silence, rather grab it and I'd rather sit in meditation. <laughs> With something I'm sure you would appreciate, haven't you read the bits of transliterate? No, sir, it's something on which I know zero. Surely a scholar should be alone. The is one of the lots of these treasures without which we miss not the report of those treasures. It is a quarter of my source of gladness. Living without me, so seems like you are madness. Some versions, the poor guy just dies. There isn't any farmer to rescue him, but we, in this version, we rescued the poor guy. So, but he learned his lessons not to be so proud of himself. All right. So, uh, Avedanand is on a roll here. He's collected all these kind of by theme. So let's uh, uh, continue with the thief. The thief entered the palace of a king at the dead of night. He overheard the king saying to the queen, I shall give my daughter to one of those sadhus, the holy saints, who are dwelling on the banks of the river. The thief thought within himself, there's luck for me. I will go and sit among the sadhus tomorrow. In the disguise of a sadhu and 
Perhaps I may succeed in getting the king's daughter. The next day he did so. And when the king's officers came soliciting the sadhus to marry the king's daughter, none of them consented. At last they came to this thief in the dress of a sadhu and made the same proposal to him. The thief kept quiet. The officers went back and told the king there was a young sadhu who might be influenced to marry the princess. There's no other who would consent. The king was obliged to go in person to the sadhu and entreat him earnestly to honor him by accepting the hand of his daughter. But the heart of the thief was changed by the king going to him. He thought within himself, I've assumed the dress of the sadhu. Behold, the king himself comes to me with entreaties and prayers. Who can say what better things may not be in store for me if I become a real sadhu? These thoughts so strongly affected him that instead of marrying under false pretenses, he began to mend his ways from that very day and exerted himself to become a true sadhu. He didn't marry, and he ultimately became one of the most holy saints of his day. The imitation of a good thing sometimes produces genuine results. When a thief dressed in the garb of the sadhu could be transformed into a man of saintly character by associating with the holy ones for so short a time, who can describe the wonderful power of the true saints and of their holy company? I think the... Uh the uh, general phrase for that is fake it till you make it. Yeah. <laughs> now, and I think there's some incidences where people have played parts in plays or movies or something of that nature that have uh, transformed them because of the character that they were playing. Uh, there was an interesting one where uh, there was an old uh, live action version of Alice in Wonderland and the uh, the young lady that played Alice uh, became a nun afterwards. And when you read Alice in Wonderland with the idea of uh, Vedanta, you can see how Vedantic it is. There's so many different Vedantic parables, uh, analogies and so forth in there about the un unreality of the world and so forth and how it's like a dream. Uh, so it was just kind of an interesting thing. Can you think of any other incident? If, if one pops into your head while we're reading, you can chime in, but I'm, I'm sure there's another one and I just can't think of it at the moment. So, um, there's one who's played Sister Claire in the Francis of Assisi movie. Oh yes, that was it, and she became a nun, didn't mm -hmm. she? Yeah, oh, she's so that was the Mother Superior of her kind. Yeah, that was the other one I was trying to think of. Mm -hmm. All right, so yeah, playing parts can have a, a profound uh, effect. Uh, Peter Schneider, mm -hmm. who's a member here, few years ago, used to write uh, little musical plays and we used to get to play and it was very profound to be able to play uh, one of the, the characters like a disciple of Jesus or Chaitanya's father or Chaitanya's uh, disciple or something. Uh, you, you really begin to be able to take on that uh, uh, vibe, you could say. And uh, it also kind of uh, reinforce the idea of meditating on certain scenes where you uh, picture yourself, say, at uh, uh, Dakshineshwar or at, uh, uh, the, in some other incidents at Kasipur Garden House or something, you picture yourself in the presence of Ramakrishna. And you, if you've read a passage in the gospel that day, then you can kind of replay it in your mind and picture yourself as one of the characters sitting there and it makes a nice meditation. All right, let's uh, continue. A person deeply involved in debts feigned madness to escape the consequences of his liabilities. Physicians failed to cure the disease, and the more he was treated for his ailment, the greater became his madness. At last, a wise physician found out the truth, and taking the feigning madman aside, said, Sir, what are you doing? Beware, lest in feigning madness you become really mad. 
Already I see some genuine signs of insanity in you. This home thrust advice awoke the man from his folly and he stopped acting the part of a madman. By constantly acting a thing, one ultimately becomes the thing. Yeah, the, you know, I remember Swami Prabhupada counseling some of our members who were in the acting business uh, to uh, try not to take parts uh, that you know, portrayed evil characters because you can, mm -hmm. you begin to take on those kind of characteristics. Yeah. All right. So, yeah, so let's continue. The parable of a Brahmin and his low caste servant. As soon as Maya is found out, she flies away. The priest was once going to the village of a disciple. He had no servant with him. On the way seeking, seeing a cobbler, he addressed him saying, hello, good man. Will thou accompany me as a servant? They'll dine well, and you'll be careful of what cared for. Come along. The cobbler said, oh, sir, I'm of the lowest caste. How can I be your servant? The priest said, oh, never mind that. Do not tell buddy who you are, or speak, or make acquaintance with anyone. The cobbler agreed. At twilight, while the priest was sitting at prayers in the house of his disciple, another Brahmin came and addressed the priest's servant. Fella, go and bring my shoes from there. The servant, true to the words of his master, made no response. The Brahmin repeated the order a second time. But the servant remained silent. The Brahmin repeated it again and again, but the cobbler moved not an inch. Last getting annoyed, the Brahmin angrily said, Hello, Sarah. How dare you not obey a Brahmin's command? What's your caste? Now the cobbler. The cobbler, hearing this, began to tremble with fear. And looking at the priest said, Oh, venerable sir. Oh, venerable sir. And find out. And found out I cannot stay here any longer. Let me flee. So saying, he took to his heels. <laughs> Anyway, sounds like Pygmalion or My Fair Lady. All right, uh, let's uh, let's go ahead with the next one. Aridasa. That's my play. Oh, here we go. It's <laughs> the bottom of the page. Yeah. Aridasa, wearing the mask of a tiger's head, was frightening a young boy. The mother said to the child. Why do you fear that, my dear child? He's no other than our Hari. He put on a paper mask. The boy still continued to cry out at the top of his voice. And Hari took the mask off his face and consoled him by putting it in his hands. The boy then understood the whole trick and was no longer frightened by it. Even such is the case of the worldly, the deluded and frightened by the inscrutable power of Maya under whose mask resides the ever-blissful Brahman. But he who has gone beyond the veil of Maya is never disturbed by fear of troubles. Yeah, so uh, yeah, the whole world is like uh, Maya in disguise. and uh, The sattva qualities show through the disguise to some extent. So just, uh, just as uh, if someone is wearing a mask, their voice of course, they can disguise their voice too, but if they haven't disguised their voice, you might recognize the voice or you might recognize their height or their build or something. Uh, so that's the sattvic aspects of Maya. And so we need to try to focus on the sattvic aspects to remove the delusion of the tamasic aspects and the rajasic aspects. But eventually, that's the sattvic part is also part of the disguise and we have to throw that away as well. But uh, once we've seen through it, then you can uh, witness the, uh, the masquerade ball, <laughs> just to say, and uh, you understand who everybody is. You've already seen them without their masks on, and you understand that Brahman is behind all those masks. All right, let's uh, talk, take the next one. One more then. Mm -hmm. Two persons, it is said, began together invoking the goddess Kali by the terrible process, 
called the Shabbat Sadana. This invocation is performed in a funeral yard, the invoker is sitting on the body of a corpse in a dark night. One invoker was frightened to insanity by the horrors of the earlier portion of the night. The other was favored with the vision of the Divine Mother. At the end of the night, he asked her, Mother, why did the other man become mad? The goddess said, Thou too, O child, did become mad many times in that previous verse. But now at last, thou see me. Yeah, there's some other stories similar to that where uh, someone uh, receives uh, illumination or, the, or a vision of a god or a goddess uh, <clears throat> with seemingly less effort than other people. And it's explained through the idea of uh, karma from past lives coming forth. Uh, you find different versions. Uh, I mean, he's, uh, Abedananda, of course, may not have been there at the same times that M was there. So versions that you see in the gospel and the versions that Abedananda have <clears throat> can be somewhat different sometimes. Uh, either different versions or different parables. They might even be different uh, uh, parables, parables that uh, perhaps M did not uh, hear at the times when he was visiting. So the more you can read from different sources about uh, Sri Ramakrishna, the more angles you can get. We don't want to be like the blind men and the elephant and just feel the trunk or something. So, <clears throat> all right, uh, time for just one more. I think this is not a terribly long one, so. A man who was out of employment was constantly bothered by his wife to get a job. One day his son was dangerously ill so he did go out. In the meantime, his son died and a search was made for the father, but he could not be found anywhere. At last, late in the evening, he was seen returning, was severely taken to task for his heartless conduct and leaving the house when his son was dying. The man replied, well, once I dreamt, I had seven sons with whom I passed the time happily. When I woke up, I found it was all a dream. I never grieved for my dream of seven sons, so why should I grieve for this? Oftentimes this is put in the, the context of a farmer uh, rather than this uh, context. Uh, uh, the first part sounds like uh, yeah, you're wrong no matter what you do. You're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. <laughs> but I don't think that was the point of this parable. But that's what it sounded like it was starting out to be. But. Uh, uh, that, yeah, there is another version of this uh, that we usually hear, but it's the same idea that, uh, but you know, you read in the, the stories of the disciples too, that they, they grieved for each other when other, you know, when Ramakrishna died, when Holy Mother passed away, when any one of the close members passed away, uh, they grieved. So it was not uh, like grieving is for boat or something. It was, it's a natural process. People naturally grieve, but it's how quickly you can get over it and realize that this uh, is just the nature of maya and that it's part of the, the, the dream. And we have bad dreams from time to time and then uh, we go on and have good dreams. So it's just uh, all part of the process. All right, well, we're just about uh, time to close tonight. So we'll close with our chant. Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purnat Purnamudachyate Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnameva Vashishyate Om Shanti 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 Filled with Brahman are the things we see Filled with Brahman are the things we see not. From out of Brahman floweth all that is. From Brahman all, yet is it still the same. Oh, peace, peace, peace. <laughs>